In which dimension? Does His Holiness the Pope want to exert power, I'll take him as an example, in this world or the next? Seems to be more interested in exerting power in the here and now. And that's what I would do if I was him. If he was to say, our kingdom is not of this world, he might surrender the secular power that the claim to the knowledge of God and his intentions gives him right here and right now. It's a fairly easy trick, I think, to see through. Uh, Professor McDonough mentioned my work on Mother Teresa. Let me give you an example, because she is, I think, of all the religious figures in the recent past, uh, of the last century, as a matter of fact, the most revered, respected, automatically and axiomatically praised <coughs> by the secular, uh, by the liberals, by people who granted to her uh, sainthood, in, in, in its human sense. Now, why should a woman who's, who is not preoccupied with the things of this world, who doesn't care enough even to have more than a pair of sandals and a sari, why should she care that the Republic of Ireland, the state of Ireland, the government of Ireland, should have in its constitution, as no other European country now does, a legal ban on divorce and civil marriage or remarriage. Why should it matter to her that that's the case? Her kingdom is not of this world. The teachings of the Catholic Church on divorce and remarriage may be very strict for Catholics. Catholics must observe them. Catholics put themselves voluntarily under the domain of this church. But there's no authority in Catholic doctrine for a state saying that all its subjects, Catholic and Protestant, must take Catholic canon law as their own law. They can't escape it. They must submit their own marriages, their own morality to this. Mother Teresa left Calcutta for a long time to campaign in Ireland to make sure that, that stayed in state law. Knowing that if state law in Ireland enshrined only the teachings of the Catholic Church, that it made peace between Protestant and Catholic in Ireland impossible, unthinkable, unattainable. And knowing that an Irish woman who might have been married to a child abuser, a drunk, a rapist, and a bully, could, ex could expect no absolution if she left this man, let alone if she sought to remake her life for herself and her children with another marriage. For that, there could be no forgiveness. Not this time just the revenge of the Irish state, but later, in the afterlife, further punishment for this blasphemy would ensue. That's how Mother Teresa devoted her political life and energy, except at the same year when her friend, the Diana Spencer girl, who some people prefer to call Princess Diana, I don't myself recognize the claims of the House of Windsor, um, got divorced. Uh, Mother Teresa gives an interview to the Ladies' Home Journal in which she says, I'm so glad to hear that my friend Diana's got divorced. Her marriage was so obviously an unhappy one. This, in other words, completes the picture by returning us to the days of the sale of indulgences by the medieval church uh, to the rich while preaching abstinence, uh, misery, shame, guilt, and revenge to the poor. This is something about which I do not believe moral neutrality is possible. It is a false claim of power in the secular world based upon a false claim of knowledge about an ethereal world beyond. No one who is subject to this thinking is, in my opinion, intellectually or mentally free. And I allow myself the digression of the favorite religious object of the, of the secular uh, liberal community. Now, there are those who say, and I, I uh, sympathize with them, is there not something bleak and uh, tedious in what I'm saying? Isn't there something rather forbidding and dull and literal-minded in what I am advocating. Are we to just live as if there was nothing but ourselves? What about the sense of the transcendent? What about the feeling of awe? Uh, can I tell a quick joke about awe, by the way, before I go on? I'll risk it. Um, I've recently been to see Mel Gibson's uh, hideous film, which op opens uh, on Wednesday. <laughs> Disgusting appeal, as far as I can see, to the gay, Christian, sadomasochistic niche market. Um, 
which may be larger than Gibson wants it to be, um, and which has a, very, a number of other theological and philosophical deformities. But reviewing this meant, meant I had to go back and watch all the other biblical epic uh, movies as well. And it's in um, The Greatest Story Ever Told, I think, where John Wayne plays the Roman centurion, standing at the foot of the cross, holding a spear in the rain as the clouds gather and the thunderstorm begins, who says, truly, this man was the son of God. And the director watched him do it. They had the rain machine on, the earthquake rumbles. With so cut. Uh, John, John, that was great. That was really good. But could you do it next time with a little more awe? The Duke is a professional to his fingertips. Sure. Cue rain, cue earthquake rumbles, darkening sky. The pelting comes across the centurion's face. He grasps his spear and says, Ah, oh, truly this was the son of God. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, are we to live without awe, without transcendence? I think not, because we have innate in us an appreciation for beauty, an appreciation for literature, an appreciation for irony, which is the great saving element in the human discourse. But more than that, and I, here I trespass into an area where I'm much less um, secure, if you want awe, and if you want a sense of wonder and splendor, spend a few minutes with a page or two of Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. Or have a look at what the Hubble telescope has been sending back to you. Or spend a little time looking at the extraordinary discoveries that are being made by the unraveling of the string of our own ribonucleic DNA. We now have, we are, you are, particularly, uh, ladies and gentlemen, younger among you, privileged again, yet again, as if you weren't privileged enough, heaven's sake, to be the first generation to whom it, it's become possible to look really at and, and closely at and close up at what the origins of our universe and our cosmos and our human nature and species really is. And it's wonderful. Look at the reflection on into the future and the past that the Hubble telescope provides. Look at what Hawking has discovered about the extraordinary majesty of this universe. Realize in it that you can contemplate this without any argument from design, that the argument from design or the argument of an original cause is too paltry to take account of anything so splendid and so various. Uh, I'll give you a single case, that of the event horizon. I, I'm sure there are people here who know more about the event horizon than I. Who knows what the event horizon is? Fantastic. Uh, only one. Um, I, I'm usually have, um, I'm more nervous because I'm afraid that someone will know much more about it than I do, but you don't have to know very much. The event horizon is the lip or the cusp of the black hole. If you could, by any, by any scheme or stratagem, travel to the edge and lip, cusp of such a black hole and tip over what is called the event horizon into it, you would at that moment, in theory, be able to see the past and the future. The limiting fact, of course, is that of all things you wouldn't have enough of at that moment, you wouldn't have enough time uh, to register it. But in theory, you could be doing this. And Stephen Hawking, who is himself very gravely ill and has labored under a, a, a terrible disadvantage of a frightful malady for many decades and is an extraordinary example of humanistic survival, and who, when asked, as he had to be, by the way, to, by the Vatican, to a conference on the attempt to reconcile religion and physics a few years ago, made the very arduous journey, and when he was asked, was there anything else you'd like to see in Rome while he was there, he said, yes, you'd like to see the transcript of the trial of Galileo, which they do actually have in the Inquisition office, still locked up, and brought out him. Hawking has a colleague who's also unwell, who says that if his illness gets any worse and if, and if things advance the, ever to the stage where he could have his wish and he decided that things were so bad he'd have to take his own life, a journey to the event horizon is the journey he'd like to take as his conclusion. Now, isn't that more awe-inspiring, more transcendent, more impressive than the burning bush saying? I would maintain that it was. And it's a great deal more intellectually rewarding 
to study and doesn't, re uh, doesn't rely upon the unsupported word of Stone Age peasants either. 